Thank you, General Hickman, and good afternoon. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak today. It's really an honor to be here. This invitation is personally meaningful to me because I always wanted to be a Boy Scout when I was a kid. I was so excited to hear a few years ago that women can now earn the same merit badges as young men. And I'm so proud to hear we had our first class of female Eagle Scouts this past year. Ooh. My dad was a scoutmaster, and my brother was an Eagle Scout. And the organization has had a tremendous impact on me personally and my family. Hopefully, I can illustrate how influential the Scouts program is for developing young leaders of character for our country. I think our four Scouts of the year, Max, Rithwick, Taylor, and Tyler, are evidence of that. And I think the Scouts program helped put them way ahead of where I was at their age. <laughs> I also want to, and legally need to, add the disclaimer that all of my comments are my own opinion, not that of the Army, West Point, or the Department of Defense. <laughs> I am still active duty. Uh, as I mentioned, the Scouts had a huge impact on my life from an early age. My older brother Mike joined our local uh, Cub Scout troop in Connecticut when he was about eight and I was around six. Some of my best childhood memories are with the Boy Scouts, which is weird because I wasn't one, but my parents didn't let that get in the way. They knew I wanted to challenge and test myself at the same skills my brother was learning and let me tag along whenever possible. I remember going to a local campsite with Mike's troop. My mom talked the den mother uh, into having me stay overnight in somewhat of a stowaway capacity. My mother, who hated camping, agreed to stay with me in a separate female cabin just so I could get some of the experience. I loved sitting around the fire telling jokes and ghost stories until it was time to go to bed. And I'll never forget how my dad bought me an extra Pinewood Derby kit and held informal races for me on tracks that weren't being used. It may have been unofficial, but I didn't notice. And it was through Boy Scouts that I was introduced to West Point in the first place. Every year, the United States Military Academy held a Boy Scout Jamboree, and my dad took my brother to it several times. I never went, but I heard the stories when they got back, which I think was mostly an attempt by my dad to instill some discipline in me. He would inform me at the dinner table that West Point cadets could only chew their food three times before swallowing. And they, had to, they could only answer their superiors with yes sir, no sir, or no excuse sir, and that I should take note. I assumed West Point was some kind of prison. <laughs> not too far off. Uh, I, did really, I did not really think about the Academy again for many years, but I felt a sense of duty towards service to my country from those early experiences with the Scouts, which always included a recitation of the Scout Oath. When people hear that I was the first woman to join the infantry and one of the first two women to graduate Ranger School, they always ask, why did I want to pursue those goals as a young girl? Well, the short answer can be summed up by th the three tenets the Scouts chose uh, for the theme this year, service, values, and leadership. It's appropriate that we just marked the 20th anniversary of 9-11, as that incident was my first call to service. I knew then, as the nation embarked on two wars, that I wanted to join the infantry. However, in addition to being barred from combat service as a woman, I was also only 12 years old. <laughs> I presented a problem. I watched the headlines throughout my middle and high school years grow increasingly troubling as soldiers' tours got extended and the forces were stretched thin. One of my current West Point professors in my grad school program said that in a three-year period, he spent 30 months out of 36 in Iraq away from his wife and kids. It seemed increasingly clear that the wars would not be over by the time I was 18, and it felt like it was my turn to share some of the burden. The United States had given me so much and I felt like I owed more than most people back to my country in service. However, the infantry branch was still closed to women when I was 18, and that was all I knew about the Army. You can probably blame Tom Hanks for that. Between Saving Private Ryan, Forrest Gump, and Band of Brothers, I felt specifically drawn to frontline combat, which my parents were not thrilled about. Uh, I also distinctly recall seeing G.I. Jane and thinking, yes, that, how do I do that? <laughs> I'm not sure else how to describe that kind of call to service where you feel strongly motivated by a cause and you find 
a way to contribute that suits your talents and interests. Uh, learning about Tyler Grant's biography reminded me of myself, as she already knows that she wants to be a police officer, and not just that, but the chief of the police department, someday. She's already proven her commitment to the service by scoring second in a domestic abuse scenario and first in a law enforcement written exam. I'm glad the Explorer program has given her the chance to hone her skills and learn what she's truly passionate about. I spent all four years at West Point trying to change the policy that barred women from combat roles. I never missed an opportunity to raise the concern in any briefing, regardless what that briefing was about. If a general off General, for general officer was on stage explaining new uniform standards, I would still ask the question, sir, when do you think women are gonna be in combat arms? I developed somewhat of a, of a reputation for that. The policy did not change before I graduated and I felt a little defeated that I, at the age of 22, did not have much influence over national security policy. However, there are many types of service, and I was honored to be commissioned as a second lieutenant in the military police and to serve as a platoon leader in Afghanistan. When I returned home from that deployment in 2013, however, I was met with a full inbox and a ton of text messages from my friends and classmates. They'd heard Ranger School was about to open up to women and wanted to know what I was going to do about it. I have a lot of Ranger School stories, but I think my favorite ones speak to another tenant for the scouts this year, which is leadership. A big part of leadership is setting the example, and with that comes preparation and commitment to goals. I'd always tried to stay prepared to attend Ranger School. If at any moment the doors open, I wanted to be ready to walk through them. But with the rumors of the school opening soon, I stepped that preparation up. I ran two marathons that summer, uh, one actually in Nashville. Um, and that was not a thing I normally did. Uh, it was not a thing required for ranger school either. I just thought that if I set my goal well above what I thought my capabilities were and could achieve it, then I might feel mentally ready for the course. My first goal was just to not stop running, and then my goal was to get under four hours, which I achieved that July. Reading Taylor Bell's story reminded me of this time in my training. As she decided to set a pretty arduous goal for herself, to earn a merit badge in all 50 states, and that she's even exceeded that achievement and earned 78 badges in 50 states, is a testament to her commitment to accomplish any mission, even one that had never been done before. And that kind of above and beyond men, uh, mindset is exactly the type of attitude the Scouts inspires in young adults, and also led her to co-host a scouting broadcast on social media and build a canine training course for a local police department. Developing that mentality now at a young age will equate to the confidence necessary to face challenges later on when it's really needed. I really needed that kind of resilience just to get into Ranger School. In September of 2014, the Army announced its plan to integrate women into the course. They reserved 70 slots for women to enter in April 2015, along with about 300 men. In order for women to get to that pilot course, however, we had to pass a two-week pre-ranger program at Fort Benning. And in order to get into that course, we had to be certified at our home unit, which was the 101st for me. I signed up for the previously all-male certification at 3rd Brigade, uh, the 101st, and was the only woman there in 2014. I trained so hard over that summer to be physically prepared that I came in first place out of all the men on the five-mile run I did over 60 of the 49. <laughs> I did over 60 of the 49 required push-ups, performed over the bare minimum of six chin-ups, and ran the 12-mile ruck march with close to 70 pounds. However, after all of that, I failed the land navigation test. <laughs> land navigation in the Army is when you're given a map, a compass, five grid coordinates, and several hundred acres of woods to go find those grids in. You start the test around 3 a.m., so you have two and a half hours of dark and then two and a half hours of light, during which uh, you have to find four out of five points. At each grid coordinate is a placard about this big uh, in the middle of the woods, usually surrounded by thorns, and you have to write down the code on it to prove that you found the point. I'd always been okay at this task, but I realized I needed to actually get good at it if I was gonna go to ranger school. 
I knew there was another certification in December, so I spent the entire month of November becoming one with the forest. I memorized my pace count for 100 meters, whether I was running or walking, going uphill or over terrain. I practiced after work and on the weekends, in bad weather, in the cold, in the dark, until I knew I couldn't get lost if I tried. All this work paid off. When I went back to the certification in December, I was named the honor graduate and earned a slot to the Fort Benning Pre-Ranger course in January. I passed that course with five other women, but I did not realize the benefit of all my effort until the first phase of ranger school. During one of our practice patrols, I was designated as the compass man, which would have terrified me just a year prior, uh, responsible for keeping our squad of 12 ranger students on course over three kilometers in the woods to our objective. At one point, the instructor told us to wait and just sit down, and he asked who the navigator was. I immediately thought I was in trouble, but slowly raised my hand. He told my squad mates they should just keep me as the navigator for the entire course because we were supposed to get an attack by an enemy force, but we'd moved so quickly through the woods they did not have time to get in place, and we now had to wait for them to catch up and attack us. <laughs> <laughs> After that, the other ranger students asked me to plan their routes and serve as the squad compass man. I could not believe how with some effort and determination, I was able to turn one of my biggest weaknesses into one of my biggest strengths. This ability to recognize obstacles as opportunities is something, learned, something best learned early on and something the scouts encourages in young leaders. One of the Eagle Scouts honored today, Rithwick Nariandus, exemplifies this ability. When he was faced with the death of a family friend, he recognized the need and took initiative to create a mental health awareness club in his high school. Instead of being defeated by a tragic event and set back, he looked for a way to help others. He also organized his classmates to write letters to senior citizens who were isolated from their families. It is that kind of leadership that the Scouts inspires and which is critical to instill in America's youth. Finally, I made it to Ranger School in April of 2015, after about 20 years of secretly wanting to be there. <laughs> of the 70 women the Army expected to report, only 19 of us passed the grueling pre-Ranger course. I'll take a minute to explain what exactly Ranger School is, for everyone not familiar. The course is supposed to be 62 days if you go straight through. It took me 123 days, but who's counting? Um, there are four phases each of which can be reattempted one time if you fail. If a phase is failed twice, a student can be dropped from the course. Um, but there is a chance to take a day one recycle where you start all over from the very beginning. This option is not preferred because the initial ranger assessment phase is also called Hell Week, and it eliminates 60% of the students. This week includes the physical events I mentioned earlier, along with a swim test, obstacle course, and the land nav. Next is the patrolling phase, where students execute missions like ambushes in squads of 12. Then the mountain phase, which is aptly named, as it takes place along the Appalachian Trail. And the swamp phase is conducted in the lovely Everglades in August, in my case. Uh, each phase is two to three weeks long, and a student has to receive a passing grade on their leadership patrol in order to move to the next phase. So eight out of the 19 women made it through the initial ranger assessment week. And then all eight of us failed our graded missions, not just once, but twice, which meant we then had to go in front of the ranger school commander, along with about 40 men, to determine our fate in the course. At this point, after 60 days of being beaten down, I was tired. I was tired of only getting two meals a day, usually 15 hours apart. I was tired of sleeping for only two hours or 40 minutes a night. Tired of carrying 70 to 100 pounds on my back, walking for hours through the woods, sometimes until the sun came up, being exposed to the Georgia heat or the rain, or somehow also the cold when it got dark and our clothes were still soaked through with sweat. Um, I was ready to leave. However, after talking to my parents on the phone, I realized I would regret trying not to do everything I could to stay in the course. I remember why I went to ranger school in the first place and thought back to my values. It was not about me at this point, but about all the women who had come after me who deserved to attend the best training available uh, before they had to lead soldiers in combat. 
The next day, I was called in front of the commander. He gave me the same news he gave to four women before me and said I was going to be dropped from the course. He explained I was a good candidate, but I should go train up for a bit and come back if the Army ever does this again, if the Army ever lets women back into ranger school. That did not sound promising. I knew I had to ask for the dreaded day one recycle. The commander seemed surprised and said he did not think I could physically pass the first week again. That week was hard for soldiers in peak condition, never mind after two months of ranger school. I did not think I could pass either, for the record. <laughs> but I said, I think I can make it, sir, and I'd like to try. He kicked me out of his office to wait for what seemed like an eternity while I asked myself what exactly I thought I was doing. I did not want to restart this course. <laughs> All I wanted was to sit in the air conditioning, take a shower, and eat a good meal. But then he called me back in. He said he'd give me the same deal he offered to some of the men. If I could do the mandatory 49 push-ups right there in his office, he'd let me stay. I did not think I could do this. And I thought, OK, I'm off the hook. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. I did everything I could. But much to my surprise, and I think everyone else's, I was getting around 40 push-ups, and I realized I could keep going. I knew I had to at that point, and did the full 49. When I stood up, the commander told me to move my bags to the day one recycle pile, and that I was going to stay in the course. Two other women, Captain Shea Haver and Major Lisa Jaster, were also able to do the push-ups, and we entered ranger school for a third time together. After that, Shea and I made it straight through the course, and Lisa graduated two months after us. As much as I learned and progressed over that final two months, nothing made as much of an impact on me as that moment I had a way out of the pain and the suffering, and I chose not to take it. I chose to fight and stay in the game. I think it was my strong sense of values and selfless service to the women that would come after me and the emphasis that the Army places on personal courage that made me not want to quit. I think instilling a strong set of values in the Scouts is the best way to set young Americans up for success and to set our country up for the future. Max Tyndall showed a tremendous commitment to the Scout value of helping others when he spent his time and energy to raise over $1,300 to send his whole tiger cub den to camp. The type of selflessness Max showed in providing for his whole den to attend camp is a great sign of the impact the scouts uh, can have and a very promising sign for our future. In conclusion, the scouts is the premier organization for developing leaders among America's youth. Leaders who are going to be expected to tackle some of our nation's most pressing issues such as climate change, social injustice, cybersecurity, national defense, and countless other problems. I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of the issues that is particularly close to my heart at the moment, which is Afghanistan, and the people and our good friends that are still left over there, including one of my linguists. It is the character and the values taught in an organization like the Scouts that's going to lead these young adults uh, to become outstanding leaders in the country. And uh, I'm very supportive of the organization, if you can't tell. And uh, I'm very honored to be here and happy to speak uh, on their behalf. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Rangers lead the way.